You're listening to Peel Talks Housing, the Region Appeals podcast delving deep into complex issues around affordable housing and homelessness and efforts to help residents get and keep housing. Episodes will feature residents with lived experience, Region Appeal staff, our partners, academics, policymakers, and other leading voices in the affordable housing sector. The opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individuals expressing them and may not reflect the opinions of the Region of Peel or the direction provided by the Region Appeals Council. I'm your host, Axel Villamil, and on this episode, we'll focus on housing with supports. We're joined by three guests, Dr. Gary Blotch, Catherine Gibb, and Amanda DeFalco. Their experience in this field will help us understand why bricks and sticks alone are sometimes not enough for people to maintain stable housing. So why don't we start out with you guys telling us about your professions? Gary? Uh, I'm a family physician, so I spend most of my life working with people on the front lines of primary care. Uh, I do that in a family practice uh, with St. Michael's Hospital, but also in homeless service settings. Uh, And I've worked in various settings around the city, Uh, most recently with a team that takes referrals from people who are long-term homeless and have very high needs, often have just been in hospital, and then come to our team to work uh, really on the transition towards being housed, ideally, which means that we deal with a lot of just life stabilization uh, and then social stabilization around things like income and housing. Awesome. How about you, Catherine? So my role within services and housing in the province is a program manager. So um, within my portfolio, I work with a housing first collaborative. So we're six partner organizations that are wanting to um, provide housing and supports to individuals that are experiencing chronic homelessness within our community. Uh, And my role within the collaborative is is that of a coordinator, uh, program developer. Um, I build capacity within our uh, collaborative team to achieve uh, high fidelity standards within Housing First. That's great. Amanda? My role at the Canadian Alliance is Deputy Director of the Built for Zero movement. And Built for Zero is a movement with a group of leading communities across Canada working towards ending uh, chronic and veteran homelessness. And so my job is to work with local communities to help them reimagine what ending homelessness will look like. So moving from thinking about individual problems to thinking about systems problems. And so I help communities solve system issues around ending homelessness. Amazing. So a lot of great knowledge was brought up here. So I kind of want to get into the idea of what supports offer the greatest return on investment? Um, And when can a community put its resources and energy to generate the most successful outcomes for a household in need or the widest impact for households needing support across the community? But I would love to know what all of you wonderful experts think. So, I mean, again, the the question of what supports are most useful is is a bit of a complex one, right? I'd say that if we're going to look at it, we've already talked about the fact that this is a very individual, sorry, a very individual process. Uh, And so those supports need to be individualized. I mean, but I'd say from what we know in from the literature that's looked at supportive housing uh, and also from just experience with this, I mean, there's there's a couple of levels of support. So number one, and you have to say it, even though it's really obvious, is you need housing, right? I mean, you cannot provide supportive housing without housing. It sounds really simple. It is not so simple in the situation, the the, the context in which we are uh, living right now. There just is not a lot of housing out there. Uh, number two, you need income, right? So if you have access to housing, you need to be able to pay the rent, but you also need food and you need to live. I mean, in all, you need to clothe yourself and, you know, live a, a sort of decent, dignified life. So those are the two like absolutely foundational pieces. Um, Beyond that, I mean, just if you look at kind of the most common issues that I think people who experience homelessness are are struggling with and that present barriers to staying housed, I mean, certainly uh, mental health supports, uh, supports around substance use, supports around dealing with trauma uh, are probably the biggest ones in my experience. And, you know, Providing those uh, requires, again, programs and individualized case management supports and, and different types of organizational supports targeted at partic- uh, people's particular situations, but within those big realms and those big buckets. 
So that's sort of a bit of a simplified answer to what I think is a actually a very complex question. I love the question, but also return of investment sounds a little cold sometimes because I know these are people. So I would love your thoughts as we you know step more into this. The answers here is what does a return of investment really look like or is there a better way we can phrase that as we talk? I don't think so. I think it's okay to hold the service system accountable for outcomes and a return on investment. You know, people have different ways of looking at social issues. Um, And if one of the ways is economic, I think that that, you know, we have to be respectful of people's different views. Um, What I would say, and this isn't specific to Peel, um, but it is a common theme across North America, is a return on investment Um, happens when you start spending less on emergency responses. And not to say that they're not needed, they are. But if we continue to invest in the emergency responses, that emergency system is just going to keep growing. And if we're not focusing on the housing, we're just growing a, a cohort of individuals who will never go further than an emergency shelter. And so the return on investment is the housing and related supports, as as Gary mentioned. Um, we know based on data that the cost of having someone in an emergency shelter, this is just the homelessness serving system, not the healthcare, not criminal justice, not emergency services, just to shelter somebody with a bed and a meal is roughly t- uh, upwards of $20,000 per person per year. To house somebody with supports averages between sixteen dollars to $19,000 per year. So not only is it better for the person because now they have a house and a life and they're not in crisis anymore, it's also a good return on investment economically. So it it seems like a no brainer. But again, it's that system change that has to happen. And as we know, change is hard. So we're we're getting there. I can see so many communities like Peel across Canada that are moving in that direction. Peel certainly is having lots of conversations around that. I'm uh, an advisor for Peel. And so I get to work with all the awesome people in the community um, you know, quite frequently. And I can see the work that's underway and there is transformation happening. So that's exciting. Absolutely. Catherine, you've been in this industry for over 20 years. So in terms of systematic changes within it, how have you seen, has this, has this actually been, uh, I guess, um, working or happening as you've seen the, the, the wheels of bureaucracy are a little slow sometimes, but at the end of the day, does it actually um, come out to something that's positive? Yeah, I mean, I'll, just to carry on some of what my colleagues have said, um, I think certainly housing, absolutely, 100%. Um, we've seen great outcomes um, within my housing first program I'm part of. Um, after housing is secured, um, we have a great um, housing stability rate. Um, and it's because we're able to um, uh, provide housing allowances that are portable, Um, So there's certainly the choice built in um, so that individuals can identify what housing works for them. There needs to be a a diverse approach to housing resources, not just, you know, it's not going to work for everybody. It's one building for, you know, everyone is not the uh, appropriate way to do it. So there's there's innovative ways that you can uh, build housing stock and housing supply, but also to go back to um, Uh, clinical supports. Uh, I think there needs to be certainly a trauma-informed approach to services across the board. If someone hasn't experienced trauma before they experience homelessness, certainly the experience of homelessness itself is a traumatizing one. Uh, So there's definitely um, a need for a trauma-informed approach. Um, But also looking at, again, from a systems perspective, how existing services can work together uh, so that you're not trying to build one be all and end all service, but it's around that coordination. Absolutely. I think there's a bigger conversation because I'm leading into something for you, Gary, is that it's not a one size fits all in general, at least what I'm learning here as somebody looking from the outside in, because you can just give somebody a house and call it a day. There's much more underlying issues and you know logistics that have to go around that. And as you said perfectly, is that there has to be a mix. So I was wondering, talk to me about the mix of housing and health supports um, that are offered and, um, you know, why does this matter? Uh, I mean, again, I, I think we keep sort of circling back to this really important idea that these supports have to be individualized, right? And based on a particular person's situation. Um, you know, for example, uh, we know that there's a huge overrepresentation of Indigenous people within the, the community of people experiencing homelessness. I, uh, to, to kind of provide supports that counteract the, the sort of degree of historical trauma and systemic trauma that 
people who are indigenous have experienced that have, have, have contributed to the the experience of homelessness for them uh you really need to build specific services that that target those experiences and those underlying factors you know and that is just one element of people's identities right i'm picking that out as an example uh you know if if you sort of look at the complex like intersectional identities that people have you're you're going to have to offer services that address those from many, many different angles. I also want to pick up on, I, I don't want to let the return on investment piece go uh, before saying something about it. Because um, I actually, I, I bristle at it a little bit. I mean, I, I respect the fact, I mean, Amanda said, yes, you know, systems should be held accountable. You know, I, I, that's fair. Although I will say a couple things. First of all, we know from the data that you know, especially for those who've been homeless for quite a long time, it often costs more to have to provide supportive housing, at least in the first few years, than it would for them to be homeless, right? And we see this sort of uptick. And then over time, the costs often go down, especially if someone stays housed. But we need to be ready for the fact that we have to invest in counteracting the, the pieces that have caused people to, ex- to, to end up experiencing homelessness. Right. So we have to be willing to put that in. And, and I guess where I bristle a little bit is that we accept that there is a social cost to dealing with many issues that people face in society. Right. So if I develop, I don't know, lung cancer, right, no one questions the fact that I'm going to cost the system hundreds of thousands of dollars to treat that lung cancer. No one is saying, you know, down the road, is that treatment going to save money for the system? Right. I I never hear that being put forward, you know, as a question around lung cancer. No one's saying we should withdraw treatment for lung cancer if it's not saving money down down the road. Right. What people are saying is that we want to make sure that you live as long as possible, as healthily as possible and as happily as possible. And that's why we are providing you this treatment. Right. I would love to see the approach to homelessness take a similar uh, a similar angle. Right. Which is that experiencing homelessness is in some ways an illness, a disease. It's a social disease, a systemic disease, but one that we should take responsibility for and should happily be spending money to counteract and to treat. You know, I'm pretty sure it will actually save money down the road, but that actually I don't think should be the primary motivator for offering supports uh, and offering people pathways out of, out of homelessness. So knowing about the importance of supplementary supports in ensuring successful housing outcomes, do you have any concerns about the landscape of housing supports today? Variety, quality, availability, accessibility, what is keeping you up at night? That's a loaded question. Uh, All of the above. Um, It's increasingly challenging um, in the housing stock that we have available to us to uh, to continue to access uh, safe, affordable housing in our community. I think we all are well aware of that. Um, What what was achievable with a a portable housing allowance three years ago is no longer achievable. It's, it's, it's really challenging to um, keep up with the going cost of housing. Um, So I think we need to really prioritize and focus on uh, affordable housing initiatives that will support, um, individuals like systematically. Um, so not necessarily just from a housing first perspective, but also like looking at, um, prevention, um, and, uh, rapid rehousing. These are just terms that are like used within like, uh, the, the sector. Um, I, it's challenging to focus on sort of one sort of component of it. Cause it's a systemic issue around access to a uh, continual access to housing stock. Um, so that, um, we can continue to support individuals within a supported housing program. Uh, so I, I, I spend a lot of time worrying about that for oh, sure. Well, for sure. I mean, just reflecting on the word housing stock, period. I don't think a lot of people really understand that there's a finite amount of you know places you can provide people. And oh my gosh, that, thanks for adding another thing that I have to stay up at night for. So I appreciate that information. Uh, Amanda, I would love your thoughts on uh, that too. Just to, just to stress you out even further. Perfect. <laughs> In addition to the limited housing stock, when you start thinking about affordable housing, mm-hmm. that stock 
um, drops significantly um, if, as opposed to the broad, you know, housing stock or vacancy rates that we see. You have to kind of look at the, the means of affordability and most people experiencing homelessness are coming with very um, little income to start. Um, and so you have to think about, you know, where will they live? And so um, the I thing can that- barely afford rent. Exactly, so right? So like, that happen? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, and so when you think about like this, just going back to the system conversation, if we had enough um, housing and resources, we wouldn't have to have this conversation today. And so, you know, what is it that keeps me up at night? Actually, I, I have to say I'm a bit Pollyanna when it comes to this, because I have the privilege of seeing how communities are transforming the ways that they're approaching housing people um, across this country. And we need to continue to build those proof points. So do we have enough to end all the problem, social problems of the world? No. Do we have enough to get started in the realm of homelessness? Yes. And it's just about some of that pe those pieces that we were talking about earlier around the process of how people can access those resources and how the system starts to transform and changes its approach from managing homelessness to ending it. And ending it means housing and supports. Um, and so that means that there's a reorientation of investment. There's a reorientation of how you're measuring what is an outcome. Is it that you're um, giving somebody a bed every night or is it that you're giving them a home and that they're stabilizing in their housing? As Catherine mentioned, housing stabilization um, is a great measure uh, in terms of knowing whether or not you're actually achieving what you hope to achieve. So I would say there's lots of things that keep me up at night, but I'm also very, very hopeful by seeing the progress that communities are making. Yeah. And I just, I mean, so, so I will support the fact that I think there has been progress. I think there's been, for example, a good bit of resources thrown into dealing with uh, the situation of homelessness through COVID. So there's some positive pieces there. What keeps me up at night, though, is that I still think that underlying this at a political level, uh, there's still this kind of individualistic, individual blame focus. It's a very kind of traditionally conservative focus. I think we're going to see uh, or we're starting to see a transformation, for example, of social assistance in a very, very similar way that comes back to individual oriented uh, blame as opposed to systems taking responsibility for these social issues. Uh, and these are the kind of things that really, really do worry me and really actually make me lose sleep. Great comments, more losing sleep at night. But I think it's worth losing sleep to try to fix something like this for the better, uh, better of our society. So. You know, I want to talk about housing related supports. Um, is there enough of it and why not? And why is sufficient capacity and or availability so challenging to achieve? Well, my presumption would be no. However, without the data, I can't conclusively say yes or no. Um, but what we what we've heard is no, there's not enough supports. I think the other challenge is not just volume of supports, that's one thing, it's also the coordination of supports. And so how does the healthcare system talk to the housing system? How does the child welfare system talk to the housing system and vice versa? And I think that um, one of the challenges is that we have to get our own house in order in some ways in order for, for those systems to understand how to communicate and work with us. Um, so certainly it's a lot easier for us to understand how the healthcare system works to a degree, like just like everybody else. But, um, you know, as someone said earlier, if I were to ask anybody, how do you gain access to social housing? It's a, it's not a question people can easily answer. And so um, we have to do a better job at, at being clear about those and then making those connections to other services. So certainly, you know, again, if we had all this, the services and supports that society requires, we wouldn't have homelessness. So I can presume that we don't. Um, but the benefit is having also the data and starting to be more technologically advanced as well in terms of collecting that data as a systems level. You know, and COVID bears to mind the importance of having data. If we didn't have a mechanism to track outbreaks or to track the people that were contracting COVID, we wouldn't have been able to respond effectively and we wouldn't have been able to ensure that people were getting vaccinated. The same is true for homelessness. If we don't know if what we're doing is working, then how do we know what more we need, right? Like, so there's there's that. That's my, that's my two cents. I totally agree with you. And I think the data needs to come from the right places. I think um, sometimes, even with the scenario you were just mentioning around the, the parks, um, going to and getting the information from the individuals that are impacted is important. It's not to ask us per se, 
we can provide the information that we uh, have gained from our experience, but it's going to the individuals that are directly impacted and have the direct experience uh, is crucial for you to really identify where the gaps are and, and then plan forward on, on how we're going to meet those needs. Supports have to be where people are. And one of the biggest challenges that I'm seeing is that, you know, while I work in downtown Toronto, it's probably got the biggest concentration of all types of support services anywhere in the country. Uh, my patients who have experienced homelessness are generally getting housed 10, 20 or 30 kilometers away from where those services are, right? They're often in far reaches of Scarborough or Topico or Mississauga, you know, areas that just don't have those supports available. Um, which is honestly not very useful to them, especially when there's not good public transit and it takes them, I mean, truly people take two hours or more to come see me just for a family doctor's appointment. Uh, you know, let alone having to go access multiple supports that may be very far from where they're living. I mean, that, that'll just break down services and supports and people sometimes end up even more isolated, uh, than they were when they were experiencing homelessness and sort of in the hub of where all supports are. So we need to think beyond just numbers of supports and the existence of supports to how supports are actually matching with the people's ability to access them. And just, and again, with the local context, uh, bringing it back to Peel, also like Sometimes the secondary suites or the basement apartments that people are uh, or that are is accessible to people will again not be in a close proximity to the supports that they need to their children's school, to the drop-ins, the food banks. Um, you know, so it, there's a separation there of, of what someone may need. They need to be closer to downtown Brampton. They need to be closer to downtown Mississauga, but they're just priced out of ever being able to afford to live in the, that that area. Um, at someone's situation may change. They'll need to move then from one part of Peel to another. That means if they're a family, their their children are changing schools, they're starting over fresh again. Uh, so it's, it's certainly uh, complex. It seems extremely complex, like logistically, uh, just looking from the outside and, and learning more. Um, but I, I really agree, you made that, but the, the data is, I think is going to be huge because if you just look at if X amount of people are in this area and services are here, logically, that doesn't make sense to bring them there. But we're stuck because of, you said, Catherine, that there's only so many places available for affordable housing. So this, I think this is a big question, I think, for everybody listening to, you know, how can we fix this or what are the next steps to to work to make these things more um, attainable for everybody working and moving forward in, in this uh, scenario. So with so many services, I guess, available and improvements in approaches to administration of supports, why do homelessness and associated challenges, loitering, public substance uh, use and intoxication seem more prevalent than ever in the community? Again, I think just to bring it back to the data, I, I think it would be hard to make an assumption that it may appear, um, but I would certainly want to reflect back on on if that is actually the case. It's or true not. on the data. So I actually do have a follow up to this. How do you address public perception of modern philosophies around housing first, flexibility, choice, absence of conditions, et cetera, and harm reduction when these difficulties remain so visible and pervasive? I think one of the things that that I was thinking of as you were saying that was going back again to what kind of society do we choose to live in? Do we choose to live in a society where people feel inconvenienced by someone's lack of housing? Do we choose to live in a society where we look by and see people suffering and ignore it or feel like they're somehow troubling us because of their presence. And I think that goes back to some of the things that Gary was saying about the beliefs, the fundamental beliefs and values um, that we hold as Canadians, and also the fundamental beliefs and values that we have around stereotypes and stigma. And, you know, homelessness is a form of discrimination. Like people are discriminated simply because they have an absence of a home. And then you add in those ex intersectional experiences like you're homeless and a person of color or you're homeless and have a disability or you're homeless and identify as indigenous. And so all these complexities come in and, you know, just the judgments. And so I would say we have to, you know, as Gary was saying, we have to start there is dismantling some of those really harmful beliefs that we hold true about homelessness and start thinking more about solutions and compassion and 
and really focusing more on the system issue. And it's, and again, just, you know, Gary and Catherine keep saying this as well. It's not about the person. It's about the failure of the system to be designed in a way that serves the person well. And I think that that's just, you know, we have to, you know, shift our focus from being inconvenienced by somebody sleeping rough. I think there's, I agree, like the the concept of um, people being the other. And um, there is examples of how we've been able to to move be towards uh, a new reality. Like, for example, uh, work that has been happening with Peel Youth Village. Uh, it was certainly very separate. It's a transitional housing program that's in, in just been built into an existing community. And in the v- beginning, it was very much a, an other. Um, but involving the community, for example, when there's events, in, involving the the, uh, the community in uh, recreational programs and, and sort of uh, closing that divide a little bit. And, and again, it's an education piece and, uh, recognizing that there's a very fine line. Um, you know, there's a very fine line between someone that's maintaining their housing and, 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 and doing well. And then, you know, there could be some circumstance event that happens and suddenly they find themselves, uh, experiencing homelessness. And I think, Certainly when you work in this field, you recognize how fine that line is and, and how it could happen to anyone. Yeah, I mean, it is very like, I mean, you're, you're talking about a kind of deep process of culture shift, culture change, uh, you know, reframing prejudice and stereotype. I mean, this is something that takes probably generations, quite honestly, but I, I think there are steps that can be taken towards that that really help push that along which we have not seen with homelessness right we're seeing it around things like black lives matter we're seeing it around things like you know truth and reconciliation uh around indigenous issues i mean those processes of of shifting perception are going on in some spheres but i haven't seen a, a homeless lives matter movement step up right in fact i see the opposite still coming as perceptions through the media, as as perceptions from politicians and leaders. And it's going to take, you know, a similar type of effort at, you know, start leaders and, you know, storytellers starting to tell a different type of story and show uh, that they place a different type of value on the existence, on the beings that people experience homelessness, you know, and, and, that's not a simple process. I mean, that's a process that will take a very long time. But if you have, for example, a mayor of, say, Peel or, you know, wherever uh, town you happen to be from, walking into a space with homeless people and sitting down publicly, you know, and sitting down face to face and listening to stories and showing that they are willing to treat these people as individuals, that could be a huge step forward, right? If you have and journalists and documentary filmmakers and, you know, other prominent people in society doing the same and, and sort of repeating that until, you know, you start building another sort of foundation of normality, uh, you may start to edge towards that. But there is a long way to go in that. There truly is. I mean, this is not something that's going to happen tomorrow. No, I absolutely agree. I think it takes big movements for big change. I also believe that, um, it's, you're right, it's the perception. You know, we, we all see something as one thing, but it does take, you know, officials in their, in their uh, place of power to help close the gap. And, and that's how we have to call on and as well as we can all do our part, but it does take, you know, the whole village to really make this thing happen. I will say too that, um, you know, the sector, the sector is constantly reacting to crisis. And so do they have time to think about PR and marketing and campaign. I mean, they do their best, but really all of the amazing stories, like again, my job is um, building these proof points in community to proving that ending homelessness is possible. Um, And I, again, have the privilege of seeing this all the time every day in my work. And then I think about 
how can we get this out there? And we have to build in intentional ways, you know, like this podcast about getting the message out there that there are things that are working, there are successes. And it's only by telling those narratives that we start to change people's hearts and minds. And it's not just within the community, it goes into media, it goes into other realms, like as Gary was saying as well. But there are so many amazing stories and we just put our heads down and keep working because the next person comes through the door. And so, you know, how can we build ways to to really shine those those spotlights and those proof points across the country? Yeah, negatives are easy to spot out. Seeing the positives and hearing those are the tricky things because the world itself, you know, as we see in the media, it's very tough to break through the negativity. But again, the reason why this podcast is here is let's talk about the things that are working so we can make sure that if they're working, we can continue to expand on them, double down, and and hopefully that it makes even more of a change than we think. Candidly, I had a experience a couple of days ago. I mean, there's two regulars. I'm on Queen West. So by the Drake Hotel, there's a couple of regulars. And then there's one guy, and I even caught myself too, just as you talk, like with Spiri, I'll be clear about it, that came up to me very like, he was actually dressed just generally well, but you never know that some people have, you know, problems with housing. And he's like, I'm homeless and I just need like a couple bucks. And he's like, I'm so sorry. And just like, he just felt bad. I don't know. Nobody likes to do this. Like who likes to go and, you know, if they got a, the, sorry if it's politically incorrect, the panhandling way of, of doing stuff, but he was clearly in a bad spot. And I was like, absolutely. <laughs> like, let me go and, you know, get you whatever you want. And I, I got water. It was, and I, I said, here's some water. He's like, I'm so thirsty. And I'm like, wow, you know, I was able to just easily spend you know, a couple bucks and it goes a long way. So I think we really can't judge. And that gap has to be closed so badly because there's so many people who are undervalued either intellectually, artistically, of any talent, passionately that we're not seeing that out on the media. So hopefully this actually, you know, what we're doing here is going to help even more. But what you guys do already is great. And that, that led me into my one of my next questions. This is off topic, though, just because it flows great. Why do you all do it? Why do you do what you do? Um, and we talk about the things that are bad that keep you up at night. What are the good things that you do that can maybe keep you going throughout the day? I think it's the individuals. It's it's the the humanness of it. And it's just on what you were saying. I think a lot of people have articulated to me over the years that they feel unseen. So I think it's important that they are seen. Um, and I can't really see myself doing anything else. Uh, I, I've been doing this now for um, 20 years in very different capacities. What keeps me going is seeing Im iterative improvement along the way and which is what attracts me to my job now because I get to see that all the time. Um, you know, it's just a, a really fundamental belief in social justice and in humanness. Um, and it's obviously, you know, uh, tied to my own lived experience as well uh, motivates me. Um, not everybody, you know, has the natural supports that I have to get me to where I am now. Um, and so it's just, yeah, just being compassionate and realizing like we're all just people and we all just deserve basic things in life. And um, that's what and seeing, you know, people's lives transform as a result is what keeps me going. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess I'll just add a couple things. I mean, the, the, there's something about kind of working in, I guess, like the cracks in our society, which I think this is a big one that's, that, that sort of gives an insight into, into what we need to do as a whole society to, to improve ourselves and to, to actually uh, achieve a better life and a better space and a better world for everyone uh i mean i, I just keep, i keep on coming back to that like leonard cohen quote i guess that you know there's a crack in everything that's where the light gets in sometimes those cracks are actually really really dark right and sometimes you have to work to fill them to in, in some way if you really want to kind of work to repair everything of, of what's around us like i think that i mean we know from it health perspective, that the more inequality we have in society, the more erosion there is at sort of the, the lower socioeconomic end of society, the less healthy we all are, the less happy we all are. Um, and I think that until we grapple with that reality, we will have a very hard time improving as a society overall. Um, I mean, and then on an individual level, you know, it's there, there's huge just satisfaction for me and working, you know, as Catherine said, working with individuals around 
trying to find ways to support people in in sort of emerging from these very very socially marginalized spaces right into a space where uh they can find you know a, a better likelihood of sort of achieving stronger well-being and happiness and life satisfaction and i mean professionally that's kind of what i'm supposed to be doing right yeah. so this is a space where <laughs> i find it possible to actually do that work in a way that, you know, in some cases can be very satisfying. Not always, right? We often don't see that type of improvement, but when we do, it's, it's really happy and exciting. Amazing. Well, mm -hmm. you're all heroes in my book from what I can see. Um, but I guess, you know, to, to finish up this, this act that we're talking through is, is you know, COVID-19 so much has happened. I mean, crazy that we're here, masks off healthily to talk to each other, but it's accelerated, you know, the digital transformation and evidence consistently points to the t detrimental effects of isolation on housing and health outcomes. Presumably there are risks and challenges about this transformation, but are there any benefits? You know, we've been talking about a lot of negatives. What are the benefits here of, of everything that's happened? I mean, I, I don't think there's benefits on an individual level, honestly, of the isolation for, for most. I mean, I think that generally from what I've seen in the people that I work with, it's been a very, very difficult time overall. Uh, I mean, are there meta benefits maybe to the idea that people, that this period has really kind of brought to the fore, you know, the, those cracks that we were talking about before. I mean, that the sort of gaps in our social support systems that result in people living in very precarious situations. And what we've seen in COVID is that that precarity causes a huge risk to public health, right? And I know that. I mean, that's always been the case. But I think in COVID, we've seen that really writ large, right? The, the idea that if you allow people to live without a foundation from which they can protect themselves and respond to crises like COVID, uh, we all really do suffer for that, right? And so, I mean, in COVID, it is people who have, you know, from different perspectives, uh, not had a strong social foundation that have been most at risk of COVID. Uh, and it's, it's probably the reason that we as, as a society have had to scramble and live through, you know, almost a year and a half of strict public health measures to deal with this crisis, right? And we could have avoided that. Right. And we're now spending the billions that we probably could have spent up front to avoid a lot of this happening. You know, so there's a lesson to take away. I hope it's remembered. Homelessness is like a crisis within a crisis, within an opioid crisis, within a crisis, within a crisis. And so I think the one advantage, not for people experiencing homelessness, but for um, just generally having the conversations about how housing is medicine. Right. Like never have we before as an entire society come to that realization than with COVID. And so if there's a silver lining, I think it's that um, I will say that, you know, there has been uh, additional federal and provincial investments that have come to the forefront. Yes, it's a response to after the fact. It would have been nicer if it was preventative and we could have, you know, been on the other side of this. Um, but at least there is investments being made. And I think, you know, never before I've ha have I seen such an investment in um, services for people experiencing homelessness and for housing and supportive housing. Um, a $1 billion investment just happened with the federal government this year in, the, in their budget. And so I'm seeing builds, supportive housing builds happening at levels in Ontario that I've not seen. Like Alberta has these amazing supportive housing builds. Um, I'm seeing that now in like New Brunswick and Ontario and other places. So I think that that's, that that's um, you know, again, a silver lining for sure. But yeah, definitely being able to see how important housing actually is in people's lives through this pandemic has been, I think, an eye opener for a lot of people. And I would just agree with my colleagues. I think it's, it's clear that with the right level of political will, we can mobilize and, and sort of seeing what happens next um, is, is where I'm at. I want to see again, how this trend uh, transitions into more housing and supports for the individuals that we're working with. No, I, I love that. I, I think at least my reflection on with everything that happened with COVID is that a home doesn't necessarily mean that you're okay. You know, there's many more levels to it. And I think that's, you know, a huge point of this conversation is that 
you know, as mental health, uh, at least mine really went down too when I was very lonely. Luckily, I had, you know, my partner and my dog, which was great. But the people that don't have that um, and we have a house is still there are issues. Um, so I, I think we learned a lot and I hope we can prevent more as we've learned from all these, uh, these things that have happened. We said a lot of amazing points. There's the greats, there's the bads, there's everything in between. Uh, but the first I'd like to talk to you about or ask you all is what have you learned in your role that you could share with us today that might help us collectively move forward? So I, I guess I will offer that. Uh, and again, I think we've sort of been circling around this to some degree through the whole conversation, but there, there is no one individual. There's no one organization that will find the solution to homelessness. And especially when we're talking about supportive housing, uh, it's going, it, it always requires collaboration between different, different individuals, different organizations and different sectors, right? Until you can kind of make that collaboration happen in a way that is effective, it's very, very hard to, uh, to really build up the kinds of supports people need, right? So if I come back to the team that I work with, I mean, it, in the shelters, what, What's unique about it is that actually, you know, while there's myself as a family doctor, there's psychiatrists, there's, so there's a medical component, most of the work is being done on the ground by incredibly highly skilled case managers whose job is, you know, to sort of bridge between many organizations, many social support systems, uh, government support systems, and sort of bring those all into focus on the individual that they're dealing with. Um, and often what they're battling is the silos between those systems, right? And and we see this. I mean, the fact that like within government, there are ministries that don't or hardly talk to each other around everything from housing to income to child supports to senior supports, you know, et cetera, et cetera, makes it incredibly challenged to sort of translate the reality of all those supports down to what the individual who needs all of them actually requires to to sort of uh, find a pathway out of their current situation of homelessness. So, you know, we are doing that, right? I mean, we, we sort of, we find ways to bridge that. Um, and systemically, I think there are ways to do that even more efficiently and more effectively, but that's probably the one piece that I'll, I can carry forward. Like 500 things went through my mind as you ask that question. Okay, everybody get ready for 500. Yeah, <laughs> no, I promise I will not do the 500 uh, listables of all things that I've learned. Um, the one thing I think I'll just, I'll bring it to an individual level and then just heighten something that Gary said at a systems level, but at an individual level, we talk about all of the issues and challenges that people face, but I also want to point out the amount of resiliency that I've witnessed that people have um, in the face of really, really difficult things. And just the mere survival of people without in the absence of housing and dealing with all of the other intersectional issues that come along with it, um, it just never ceases to amaze me like how resilient people are. And so I just want to point that out. Um, the one thing about systems, uh, and again, um, you know, like Gary touched on this around the silos and the dismantling of the silos. And so as essentially there's these new models that are emerging like coordinated access um, that Peel is undertaking right now and other um, mechanisms like a by name list. Some people might have heard of that. And so there's these methods that are coming out to dismantle those silos, um, especially within the homelessness serving system and, and housing. And so very exciting times to see when governments um, and nonprofits uh, that are doing the heavy lifting are coming together and reimagining the way that the work gets done. It's not just about the technical stuff. What actually is most difficult to change is the change itself, right? Like we as human beings resist change naturally. And so there are these change management elements, these mindset elements that have to come into the conversation. So I will just say, in addition to the, all the technical stuff we talked about today, um, you know, there's this other, uh, these other layers of the iceberg, so to speak. Oh, that's hard to follow. <laughs> um, I would just say like to listen, to learn, to recognize communities that do exist um, and to build communities, uh, you know, I just had a great conversation earlier today about communities of practice and, and how um, we need to move away from being isolated in our in our boxes and our silos within um, sectors and, and, and bridge 
uh, into working together. Right? There's great initiatives and innovations that happen. Um, so it's 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 connecting with those individuals and learning what what will work for our own communities and and just being continuously open to to grow as a sector and really keeping it tied back into like the experience of the individuals that we're working with. Uh, so just being open to possibility, but also keeping it genuine and, and and making sure that it makes sense for the people that we're working with. You guys fill my heart so much with your answers. Uh, so as are there opportunities for action? You know, you, you, we're talking about, yes, there are, um, you need to be mindful and open, but what are the, what are the actionables here? I know this is an open-ended question, but what do you think immediately are some things that are low-hanging fruit? And who specifically needs to be involved to get that data as well, or any of these actions that you might think of? I would say that um, there's a lot of players involved, but you just got to start somewhere. And so, you know, a lot of communities are starting with um, the agencies and programs that are receiving federal, provincial, or local funding um, to start coming together and thinking about how to collect information so that every person is known by name as a human. You know, we all have names for a reason. It's dignity. It, it provides us our global citizenship, so to speak. Um, and so names is really important, obviously, respecting confidentiality. Um, and understanding their needs and preferences and that information being shared across the system so people don't have to keep retelling their stories over and over again. I think that once we have data, we can start breaking down those silos because we'll be able to see them in people's narratives and ways in which the system is not designed to serve the person. Numbers don't lie. I think that's the one thing that we, we really need to show. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. If I'm, I, I think one starting point could just be it's in some ways conceptual, but in some ways really important is the idea of sort of recognizing housing as a human right and sort of reframing the conversation around housing, around the idea that every person has an inherent right to have a roof over their heads, right? Just like we all have inherent right to be live free of racism or sexism or the other things we recognize as fundamental human rights. I would extend that to, uh, income security as well and the the to to not having to live in poverty because i think that similar to homelessness living in poverty is often a uh, a structurally imposed and systemically imposed condition and i think that we need to take responsibility for that as a society in a very real way um and you know that'll take a pretty simple legislative flip right to to start making that declaration it's really not a hard step a whole bunch of stuff would fall out of that uh in terms of obligations for us as society and our governments but you know let's start there and just kind of reframe our approach and and see how that shifts uh what plays out on the ground i think my call to action would be the action itself i think that there's a lot that we don't know but there's a lot that we do know and i don't Think, I think we want to avoid getting stuck in the planning and and start to make incremental steps in in the direction of providing more housing resources. I think there's a lot of supports that are out there that can be coordinated, that can be collaborated on. But fundamentally, as my colleagues have mentioned, it's about housing. So just making steps in that direction, short term goals. Definitely, I'm gonna start with you this time because I feel like I keep putting you on the end. What would be your top three strategies for the future of housing with supports in Peel region? Um, again, just to sort of piggyback on what I just said is, is, is just creating some short term tangible projects around affordable housing strategies. I know we're looking for the long term, you know, the builds take time, creating something that, you know, modular housing or something that is, is you know, we can have a shorter sort of planning and cycle and provide more resources. So I, I think that would be one of my uh, suggestions to start. And then looking again at the system and and where we can better communicate and collaborate and, and coordinate um, our resources uh, that do exist. Yeah, I love that Catherine mentioned like the modular housing because it's a quick build. Uh, Toronto's doing some of that as well. I think in addition to that, um, one of the other strategies is um, using funding, existing funding for portable housing subsidies um, or additional funding that comes online because portable housing subsidies means that it's attached to the person, the rent 
the offset of rent is attached to the person, not the unit. And so that allows for flexibility, for mobility throughout community based on people's wants and needs. And then tailoring the response based on people's um, level of need, right? Like when do we stop defining someone as homeless? And, you know, somebody doesn't need lifelong supports forever and ever and ever. Some people, yes, but not all, just like regular society. Um, and so, yeah, just tailoring the supports and, and the supports, I think, you know, my bias is supports to be more mobile um, because then it allows um, those supports to follow the individual. It alleviates some of the, the tensions around um, where services are located, as we mentioned, right? Like we always think about designing the service in the benefit of the service itself, rather than thinking about how can we serve the individual. And so just again, yeah, I would say the strategies are portable housing benefits and um, tailoring services to be more mobile to respond to people's needs and where they're located. Yeah, so I will echo those. Um, I will say on the portable housing benefit front, I totally agree. Uh, in fact, I mean, I was involved in a group that created for the government of Ontario, created something called a the, the roadmap for change, a, a sort of 10 year plan for income security. And one of the key features of that roadmap was the idea of a port portable housing benefit, which I think is so key. I mean, it just it allows people to have flexibility and choice in moving through uh, the, the, the situation with found with finding housing, not everyone wants to be thrown into a hotel or into a modular unit or whatever's being, or a basement, you know, in the middle of nowhere, people want the ability to kind of be free agents within the society. Um, the other piece that I'll add is just, you know, if we can start to organize services into hubs that communicate with each other, where multiple services can be, co-located in one space, can sort of provide supports to individuals as they need them, can communicate with each other around that individual to sort of create unique individualized support plans. Uh, that would be so helpful. We've seen that emerge, like the Scarborough Hub model is a great one, uh, which is exactly that. It's multiple services in one space. There's no reason we can't create that in Peel and in other spaces as well. And it helps move us beyond some of the key barriers that I think we've been talking about here. I'll just say, add to that, that there's this, that concept of coordinated access that I mentioned earlier is just that in the absence of this, the location space, it's about bringing all of those partners to the same table and with consent of the individual, if you had the data, you can do this, um, bringing those cases to the forefront and designing tailored and customized housing and support plans for that individual based on the, the realm of services that are available in community. As Catherine said, you know, it's not so much about do we need an abundance of supports? There are supports that are out there. It's about how are they coordinated and tailored to people's needs. And so this concept of coordinated access and Peel is, as I mentioned, um, working on that right now, um, bringing all those service providers together can happen, um, you know, a co-location like a hub, sure, but can also happen at a table, um, you know, with the existing services right now. It, we don't have to wait. Absolutely. And I think for, you know, this is at the end and we're closing up this conversation, but I think I'd like to ask you, what are your final takeaways from this or your number one takeaway, at least for me, if I'd like to start off, um, if you could let me is, it looks like there's a lot of layers that need to be filled. Um, and I think it needs a support of, of very different experts and specialists, and at least from how I see things, you know, I want to see more hackathons, you know, tackle the housing crisis. I want to see more architects, you know, trying to figure out different design methods of, of providing affordable housing with using less construction, things like that. That sounds like there's an, a huge opportunity for innovation that has only really scratched the surface. And I think as a society, um, we need to start doing that uh, to better ourselves. And that's my number one takeaway. But I just like to thank you all for for what you provided me and, and not only as uh, your information, but so much for me to learn as a person. I mean, I, I think my number one takeaway is just like this. This is eminently doable, right? Homelessness is a social illness that is 100 percent treatable. Uh, it's not necessarily a simple treatment, uh, but it is we have all all the kind of resources, the supports, the knowledge that we need to deal with this, right? There's absolutely no reason that we need to have any homelessness here, right? In a rich society, full of resources, full of supports, full of expertise. So 
what we are facing is a problem of the mobilization of resources. It's a prob- problem of the coordination of resources. It's a problem of the outlook uh, of uh, or, or understanding of what underlies people's experiences of homelessness. All that can be shifted. Uh, and if there's one thing we've seen from COVID, like we're willing to put resources where we want to put them. Right. It's it's a choice. It's a very easy choice to make. Someone can flip that switch. Right. It would probably take, you know, a tenth of what we spent on covid to deal with all homelessness in Canada. Uh, and the, the fact that we're not doing it is a, is I mean, I'm going to use the word criminal. <laughs> I mean, it's a blight uh, and it's uh, it's a stain, I guess, on, on, on who we are. And, and we can shift that. We can work that stain out. So the one thing that I'll just say as a takeaway is to vote based on housing is, you know, like we can only do so much within the sector. And, uh, you know, as you were saying, you know, hackathon or other innovative creative ideas, um, bringing people into the space beyond just the sector is so critical because you all bring different lenses, um, different skill sets, different strengths. And the more public awareness and the more public will and desire um, to eradicate homelessness in this country, the better. And I'll say it is solvable. We've seen medicine had chronically end homelessness or end functionally end homelessness for chronic individuals. We've seen London, Ontario functionally end homelessness for veterans. We are seeing communities making significant progress, but it's it's by dismantling all of the challenges that we talked about here today and redesigning a system um, based on what people need as opposed to the convenience of how services are typically designed. And so my takeaway is, you know, public engagement, public involvement, um, you know, that's, that's key. Um, I mean, I would just add to, to that, just saying that housing is, is health, you know, housing, a healthy environment is one of the social determinants of health. And we have a continuum of supports within other, uh, sectors, within health sectors. Um, and we need to consider housing as a part of that. So that wraps up this episode of Peel Talks Housing. Thank you to our guests, Dr. Gary Blotch, Catherine Gibb, and Amanda DeFalco. And thank you to our listeners. You can find more information on our podcast at peelregion.ca and you can join the conversation on the Region of Peel's social media accounts. The opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individuals expressing them and may not reflect the opinions of the Region of Peel or the direction provided by the Region of Peel's Council.